Hi, everybody. You know, it's hard to believe that we've come to our last session in 40 Days in the Word. That went fast, didn't it? And I've only taught you the first of 12 different methods of Bible study that I wrote in a book over 35 years ago. Now, from the start of this series, my goal has been simply to introduce you to a lifetime of loving the Word, learning the Word, and living the Word of God. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, that means keep on going, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom comes from continuing in the word of God. And I hope that some of the tools and the methods of meditation that I've taught you uh, during these 40 days, you're going to continue on for the rest of your life, because that's where freedom comes. It comes from knowing the truth. That's where we're set free. Now, I want to take a few minutes to talk to you in this last session about how to continue in the Word. First of all, you have to make a decision to do it. Now, don't wait until you think you've got more time or better conditions or circumstances. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. That's Ecclesiastes 11.4. Just make the decision right now that you're going to keep meeting with God in His Word every day. Make a decision. Second thing to continue in the Word, make a declaration. What I mean by that is announce your intentions to other people. Hold yourself accountable. Give your family or your friends or people you work with or your small group the permission to check up on you. You see, if you keep your commitment to God a secret, it's easier to let things slip. But if you announce to your friends, I'm not going to bed any night of my life without spending some time in the Word of God and spending some time letting him speak to me. It gives you a sense of accountability. So make a declaration. Number three, make a determination that you're not going to allow any exceptions to knock you off your commitment. You have to be absolutely determined to make this a permanent habit in your life, particularly in the early months. If you start skipping days here and there real easy, you're going to find it much harder to stay committed to the Word of God. And it's continuing in the Word that sets us free and makes us His disciple. The fourth thing you have to do is double up. Now, what do I mean by that? Double up means the quickest way to support what you want to do in a good habit is get a spiritual partner for support and encouragement. Probably ought to be somebody right there in your small group. It's a person with whom you can share what you learn in your quiet time. It could be a friend. It could be a family member. But I highly recommend it, it becomes a somebody in your small group. Guys, get another guy. Ladies, get another lady that you can talk with about what God is teaching you in your quiet time. That doesn't mean you, do, you need to do your devotions with them. Not at all. But it does mean that you'll connect with them on a regular basis to share what you're learning from God in your time in the Word and to encourage each other to keep going. You know, the Bible says this, two are better off than one because together they can work more effectively. And if one of them falls down, the other can help him up, Ecclesiastes 4. There's one other thing that will help you continue in the Word. You must maintain the habit of quiet time by depending on God. In other words, rely on God's power to help you establish the habits to defeat Satan's attempt to keep you from developing spiritual maturity. The Bible says, for the Spirit God has given us fills us with power and with love and with self-control. Where do you get self-control? You get it from God. The more under control I am of the master, the more I can master the things in my life. When you give God your control of your life, then he gives you the self-discipline to stay faithful to your commitments. Now, nobody wants you to have a daily quiet time, obviously, more than God himself. He wants to spend time with you. Don't ever forget that. Every day, he has something to say to you through his word, and he wants to hear what you have to say every day to him through prayer. So don't deny God or yourself the pleasure and the privilege of friendship with him. Oh, and there's one more thing that you really must do to maintain the habit of continuing in the word, a daily devotion, a daily quiet time with God, and that is make a commitment to stay in your small group. You say, how does that work? You see, you were never meant to live the Christian life alone. We weren't meant to be lone rangers. Even the lone ranger had tanto. You need the fellowship and support of other followers of Jesus Christ. Now that's your spiritual family. It's your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you need to commit to stay together as a small group 
so you can grow together in Christ. I hope that this series won't be the last of your small group. I hope your group will continue on beyond this, and I'll talk to you about that at the end of this session. Now, in this last session, what I'd like to do is a couple things, but I, I, I want to introduce you to some basic principles of interpretation. Now, for five weeks, we've talked about application, 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 because most of the time, people just talk about interpretation. But I, I want to come back to this and deal with how do I interpret the scriptures and how do I know that what I'm interpreting is right? One of the biggest questions people ask is, how do I know if it's right? And people get intimidated today when they hear people say, well, that's just your interpretation, as if that disproves everything you believe. No, that doesn't disprove anything. There are some right and wrong principles of interpretation. There are some ways that you can follow that will always give you the right interpretation, and there are some things that you can do that will always give you the wrong interpretation. They are principles of interpretation that are accepted across uh, and around the world. And, and you need to know these. I can't go into all of them, but I want to give you four or five or maybe six basic ones uh, as we wrap up our study of 40 Days in the Word. So this way, when you look at the word, you know you're not misinterpreting scripture. So the first principle of interpretation is this. Faith and the Holy Spirit are necessary for proper interpretation. Without faith, without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to get the right interpretation of God's word. It helps to have the author explaining it to you while you're reading it. Do you ever wonder why people are not yet believers scratch their heads in confusion over so much of what the Bible says? Is it because the Bible really doesn't make sense? No. It's because the Bible is understood by faith. It's a spiritual book that only can be understood by people who are spiritually alive through Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have re not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now, the man without the Spirit doesn't accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, do you realize this verse is saying, this passage, is that to make sense of what the Bible says, you have to have a personal relationship with the author. For someone who's not yet a believer, they're not going to be able to understand what the Bible's saying unless the Holy Spirit enables them to understand. But because we belong to Christ, we can come to the Word confidently uh, that God is going to speak to us by His Spirit. Jesus said it like this in John 16. When He, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you in all truth. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit takes what is mine, the words of Jesus, and makes it alive. So here's my suggestion. Before you open your Bible, open your heart. Open your heart and ask God to fill you in a fresh way with His Spirit to give you His eyes to see and ears to hear and mind to understand what He wants, you to, to, wants to say to you in, in, in His Word. Second principle for interpretation is this. The Bible is its own best commentary. When somebody asks me, what's the best commentary in the Bible? My first answer is always, the Bible. They kind of look puzzled. And I say, you have to look all the way through the Bible to understand what the Bible teaches. The Bible interprets itself. Scripture explains Scripture and interprets Scripture. Now, a good way to practice this principle is to get a Bible with cross-references in it, in the margin. That's a list of the other verses that relate to the verse you're reading. For example, a verse about patience will cross-reference other verses about patience. And by looking up other verses on, uh, say, the cross or any other topic, you're going to get a much bigger picture and clearer picture of what God has said in all of His Word, not just that one context. The best scripture interpreter is scripture itself. Use the Bible to help you understand the Bible. The third principle of interpretation is to read the Old Testament with the New Testament in mind and to read the New Testament with the Old Testament in mind. Let me put it another way. The New Testament 
is hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. The Old Testament can seem like, you know, a pretty dark and mysterious world. The New Testament brings things more to light uh, so that you can see and understand the treasures you find there. But the Bible tells us in Romans that everything in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, was given an example for us to, 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 to follow and to, and to give us hope. Now let me give you an example. Uh, Old, Old Testament worship can be hard to understand with all of the, uh, the animal sacrifices and the blood sacrifices. But when you read the New Testament about Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice for us, bing, the light goes on. And all of a sudden, I understand, oh, all that was symbolism of God was going to come to earth and sacrifice himself for me. There wasn't any power in those animals. It was a symbol of the coming Messiah. Likewise, when you read the New Testament book of Hebrews, for instance, that Jesus is our high priest, you're not going to really grasp the significance of that title, unless you go to the Old Testament and discover the role and the responsibilities of the high priest. So what I'm saying, it, it, it's rewarding to discover how many Old Testament figures and practices pointed to Jesus in, 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 as their fulfillment. Jesus is all the way through the Bible, even though his name is not mentioned in the Old Testament, the symbolism and the pointing and the prophecies are all there. And, and so in the New Testament, you want to ask, what is the Old Testament background to this story, to this lesson? Uh, and when you're reading the Old Testament, you want to ask, now is this person or this picture a lesson, uh, also a sign or a type uh, or an image that points to its fulfillment in the New Testament? You use the Old Testament to understand the New, and you use the New Testament to understand the Old, and you read the Old with New Testament eyes, and you read the New Testament with the Old in mind. So it's just a simple principle I want you to remember. And here's a fourth principle for interpretation of Scripture. Always interpret unclear passages in light of clear passages. Always interpret something you don't understand in Scripture in light of passages that are very clear and very obvious and, and uh, use it to interpret the unclear. Now, since the Bible is its own best commentary, you need to look at the full counsel of God in Scripture to get a clear understanding when there seems to be a, quote, apparent uh, contradiction or something that seems to be weird. For, let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 15, 29, there's a very obscure reference. Paul makes reference to a group of people. He's not even referring to uh, uh, the people there in Corinth or or uh, for that matter, any, any of the Christian churches that he was dealing with. But he says, he's talking about the resurrection, and he says this, if it is true, as some claim, that the dead are not raised to life, why are these people being baptized for the dead? Now, we don't know what group Paul was talking about when he talked about that group that is baptizing for the dead, but we do know this. It's the only time it's mentioned in Scripture. And Paul is not condoning this. Paul is not using this as a teaching doctrine. There is nothing in Scripture that confirms anything else around this phrase, baptizing the dead. For all we know, it could have been a cult. He says, those people over there, they're baptizing for the dead. He's not even talking about baptism in this context. He's talking about the resurrection. And he's saying, you know, if the resurrection didn't happen, really nothing matters, including those people over there who are baptizing for the dead. But Paul is not directing us to do so. Now, here is an unclear passage. Now, some people might take this unclear verse and say, okay, somebody somewhere was baptizing for the dead. Therefore, that means we should, you should be baptized for your dead relatives in order to assure them a place in heaven. But to say that, you would have to set aside every other clear verse about salvation in the Bible, being a decision that people have to make for themselves by grace through faith. So you'd have to deny every other verse in order to interpret it that way. So what you do is you let a clear passage about baptism and about salvation help you understand this clear, unclear passage, not vice versa. That'll save you a lot of trouble. Now let me give you a fifth principle of interpretation. Don't form a doctrine based solely on a historical event. Historical events are historical events. They're not doctrinal passages. 
Uh, for example, in, in Mark 1.35, uh, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, what does that verse tell us? Well, it tells us Jesus prayed early in the morning. Now, does that mean there is a doctrine that you must get up every morning at 4 a.m. and go off out of your house, and that's the only place you can pray? Of course not. Some of you are thinking, thank you, Lord, right now. But God may convince you that this might be a good habit for you to make, but he does not command it. That is not a command. It is a doctrinal, not a doctrinal passage. It is simply a, a, a story. It, it is a narrative. Now, you cannot turn a story of when Jesus prayed and how he prayed into a command or a doctrine about how everybody else has to pray that way. The book of Acts is full of one-time experiences, and so are many other passages uh, where, you know, uh, Elijah had him get a, uh, an axe head that fallen in the water, and you could make a whole doctrine out of the lost axe head, but, but don't do that. Use doctrine to base doctrine on doctrinal passages and use narratives to teach lessons. Let me give you one more simple principle for interpreting. I, I wish I could go on and just do a whole uh, uh, six weeks on this. Never interpret Scripture based on your own personal experiences. Instead, interpret your personal experiences based on Scripture. You see, the point of Bible study is not to try to shape Scripture to agree with your subjective opinions or your experiences. So you discover instead God's timeless truth and let it shape your life. Now, there are two fancy terms that theologians use uh, for this. They call it exegesis and eisegesis, okay? You need to know these terms. Exegesis means to draw out of the text the truth that God has put there. That's good. Eisegesis, on the other hand, means to read into the text your own idea or your theory or our culture, something that you want to see there so you put it in. Eisegesis is bad. You can't do that with the Word of God. That's a perversion of the Word of God. When you study the Bible, you're not trying to get God to agree with your ideas about something. You're not trying to convince him that your position is right, and then you're looking for a proof text somewhere here to prove it. No, when you study the Bible, you come with an open heart, and you invite God to conform you to his will. You submit to the truth, not vice versa. And, and remember, he's God, and you're not. Remember, that's a good uh, strategy for anti-stress. If you ever get in a stressful situation, just repeat this 10 times and call me in the morning. God is God and I'm not. <laughs> now, if you're going to go deeper in your study of the Bible, you're going to need to understand that there are some basic tools for Bible study and how to use them. There are things like concordances, which are wordless. If you want to study a topic in the Bible or a word in the Bible, you're going to have to get a concordance. There are Bible dictionaries that explain words, like regular dictionaries. There are topical Bibles that arrange verses by topics. There are many different translations. And uh, translations are valuable because there are about 11,000 plus Hebrew and Greek words in the Bible, and we only translate them into about 7,000 English words, so no one translation can adequately uh, express the full uh, beauty of the original text. Now, it's not my place and time to explain all of these or show you all of these, but in the back of your study guide, you're going to find an explanation and some of my recommendations, not all of them, but some of the tools that you'll want to have for deeper Bible study. You'll also find a guide for choosing a Bible translation that's right for you. And many of these tools, these resources are, are actually online, and many of them are for, for free online. Now, what I want to encourage you to do is go to 40daysintheword.com. It's either 40daysintheword.com or 40ditw.com, and you can check them all out. But let me encourage you to do this. Begin building a little library of Bible resources for yourself. You know, every carpenter needs a toolbox. Every seamstress needs a sewing kit. Every chef needs a fully equipped kitchen. Every doctor needs a medical library, and so do uh, attorneys need law libraries. Every serious student of the Word of God, and that's the most important thing in your life, you need a collection of tools and resources for in-depth Bible study. Now, let me conclude by saying this to you. 
and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I am absolutely committed to spending the rest of my life helping you become a better man or woman of the word. I want you to become a better man or woman of the world. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They don't know the word of God. Biblical illiteracy is running rampant and our culture is paying the penalty for it because we don't know the truth. And truth has, has, has died in the streets, as the Bible says. So let me just close by giving you four ways I want to help you spend the rest of your life learning uh, to love the word, to learn the word, and to live out the word. The first is a website. I've mentioned it two or three times. You can go to the website 40daysintheword.com or 40ditw.com. And when you get to that website, here's what you're going to find. I have taped several additional videotapes of the other Bible study methods, not all of them, but I've taped the other Bible study methods for you to watch. If you want to go beyond just the basic devotional Bible study method, you want to learn some of these other methods, they are available on 40daysintheword.com. Second, uh, you will find a list of uh, beginning and intermediate and actually advanced Bible study reference tools and resources that I recommend for in-depth Bible study. You say, you know, well, what's the best Bible dictionary? What's the best? Well, let me help you out. I've been studying the Bible my entire life, and I've been walking with the Lord now for over 50 years. So uh, let me help you out on this. Now, the other second major resource that I want to give you is a free daily devotional for your devotional life. It's an email. It's called Daily Hope. Right now, hundreds of thousands of people get it free every day all around the world. And you can go to the 40 Days in the Word website and you can sign up and get My Daily Hope, which is a daily devotional based on the Word of God and it will be emailed to you every day for free. There's a third resource and that is a daily text of the Bible to your telephone. I want to send you a Bible verse every day to your smartphone. And that way you can look at it, you can read it. If you want to memorize it, you can. You can meditate on it. Even when you don't have a Bible and you're stuck uh, you know, somewhere uh, in, in the middle of a snowstorm, you could pull it out and get your daily word in the daily text. So here's what I want you to do. Everybody in your small group right now, pull out your cell phone, okay? It's all right. Pull them out right now. Everybody get out your cell phone. And if you want me to send you for the next year 365 Bible verses that I've selected that you can meditate on, you can memorize, you can get into the Word of God in your life to become a man or woman of the, of the Word, here's what you do. You text the word VERSE, V-E-R-S-E, text VERSE to 313131. And if you'll text the word VERSE to 313131, you'll begin receiving a daily Bible verse to your cell phone every day for a year to read, to memorize, to meditate, to think about. One other resource that we have for you is additional small group studies for your group to do together. I hope that this isn't going to be the end of your small group. If you haven't decided what you're going to do next as a small